Sir James Dyson has reinvented mundane household objects for the past 30 years. He replaced the wheel in the wheelbarrow with a ball so that it wouldn't sink into the mud. He applied jet technology to bathroom hand dryers and employed cyclonic physics to create a vacuum cleaner without a bag. His legacy so far is of elegant design solutions to problems we didn't even know we had. Sir James Dyson is speaking with Mark Fennell. Sir James Dyson, welcome to One Plus One. It's great to have you here in Australia. Great to be here. Now, vacuums without bags, a wheelbarrow that doesn't get stuck in the mud, uh, fans without blades. At least from an outsider's perspective, it seems like you have this amazing knack of taking very, what would seem like very ordinary everyday products and making them a little bit magic. Mm. Where does that interest start for you in taking domestic products and finding ways of reinventing them? Where did that begin? Well, it starts with frustration as a user. You know, as a kid, I was made to vacuum. And I remember the screaming noise and the smell of stale dust and the inefficiency of the thing, having to go outside and shake that terrible bag out and, um, you know, having to bend down and pick things up that it wasn't picking up. So it, it's frustration and wondering if something couldn't be better. There must be a better way of doing it. And uh, as an engineer, you look at almost everything and say, actually, that would be better if... And uh, that doesn't work very well. I'm just trying to think of something better. And it gets lodged in the back of your mind and suddenly somewhere you see a solution to the problem. Like for the vacuum cleaner, I was in a sawmill and saw these massive 30-foot high cyclones collecting sawdust all day long without clogging. And I thought, ah, I wonder if those work on a very small scale. So I rushed home and made a quick prototype to see if it worked. So it's, it's going around with that frame of mind, really, that leads you to where you get to. <laughs> I love how you said you just went home and you whipped up a quick prototype, because in actual fact, you went home and you whipped up 5,127 prototypes. Well, it's I didn't know that at the beginning, fortunately. <laughs> I, thought, I thought I'd get there quite easily. Uh, in fact, it took me five years and 5,000 prototypes, and it was frustrating. Uh, and actually, my, my life is a life of failure. Um, so it was 5,127. So there were 5,126 failures until I got the last one that worked. But during that, during that journey, you learn so much. So you start off building prototypes of something a part of that system that might solve the problem. And of course it doesn't. And you know, you work for days, years, and even decades trying to get something that does work. And the final solution is most unexpected. Um, but that's what my life is, and I, it's a disease. I mean, it's, you know, it's something you have to do. It's interesting you talk about failure. I'm curious, for you, what's the best mistake you've ever made in your career? Uh, well, I've made so many, it's very difficult to pick out the best one. What's uh, the one that paid off probably, the best? Probably the one that, that was most formative was um, going around showing my technology to people who are now my competitors and failing to sell it to them. Uh, and the, the, the best thing about that was, I, I mean, of course, it's very depressing to begin with. You know, why aren't these big companies doing it? Why don't they want a new bit of technology? And suddenly I realised they actually didn't want a new bit of technology. So my failure told me that if I produced a new bit of technology, I would be very different, and maybe people would buy mine rather than their old technology. So that's an example of, of, of failing, but understanding why you're failing and realizing the opportunity in, uh, in being a failure. <laughs> I'm curious still about your choice of products, because again, we're talking about things that people have in their homes. We're talking about vacuum cleaners and, and a wheelbarrow is actually my favourite one. You know, the idea of replacing a wheel with a ball. It's so simple. Well, but, but why home products? Because I use them myself. I love things that you use every day and making them work better. And most of them don't work very well. For example, I once designed wheelchairs for disabled people, which is a lovely thing to be doing. But the trouble is I'm not a disabled person, so I, didn't, I don't know what they want. And more particularly, I don't know what they can leave out. Uh, and I, I can't imagine myself being able to use something that's completely different to what they're using at the moment. Whereas with wheelbarrows, hand dryers, vacuum cleaners, fans, heat, heaters, I'm a user and I know what I don't like. And if I'm gonna do something completely different that does something in a different way, or you know, doesn't have a blade, uh, I can make a judgment about the risk I'm taking and whether or not I would buy that thing and would I like using it and would it work well for me? 
So I'm much more comfortable doing that type of thing than doing something esoteric like going to space. Have, has the thought ever occurred to you about doing something like that? No, no, because I, I love boring, prosaic products and making them better and making them more interesting. I like starting with products that other people ignore and, and appear... I mean, you know, vacuum cleaners look like bars of soap. You know, they look like no one ever loved them. Uh, but, you know, pick up a windsurfer or a ski. You know, you can see that the person who developed that was passionate about it. And I have that sort of passion about rather boring things. It strikes me that the one word that would come to describe so many Dyson products is elegant. They're very elegant solutions to, to problems. Is that a philosophy that you guys set out with, or is, or is you start from the problem and you don't think about it in a kind of an ideological sense? Well, engineers have a wonderful philosophy, particularly when they're young and they come out of university. They want to change the world. They want to use fewer materials. They want to make things more efficient. They want to use less electricity. They want to use less heat. They want to use fewer, fewer components. So that drives them to, you know, they don't need an ecological movement to want to use less plastic and less electricity. It's just what they want to do as engineers, to make, to make things neater, smaller, and as you say, more elegant. Uh, so they have a burning desire to do that, and, and so do I. And uh, the way the world's changing, uh, people who buy things or use things want to do that as well. So embodying all that in something which you know, is fun to look at and which expresses what it does and semiotically tells you what to do, these are all really important things and that's what design is all about. You're also a private British company as well, which I think is at odds with a lot of what companies at your stage would have done, which would become a subsidiary, get bought out by somebody massive. Mm. But why, why, do, why do people do that? They do that to make lots of money, don't they? Well, yeah, this is going to be my question, which is why stay private? Uh, because I'm not really interested in making a lot of money. I didn't do it for that reason. I did it because I'm passionate about engineering things, inventing things, designing things, and making things. That's my real passion. The last thing I want to do is to sell out to somebody who tells me what to do uh, and who thinks about the short term in the hope that the stock market you know, shares might shoot up. I want to think very long term. So we have programs with universities, research being, being done in universities, that so won't come to fruition, even at all, for 15 or 20 years. And I love that, you know, you've got to think long term to make real breakthroughs. And it inspires people who work for us to think that we're not thinking about tomorrow or the next year. We're thinking way ahead. What's the piece of design in the world that irritates you most? Because <laughs> I know well, there's it. something. You have a visceral reaction to design. I, I tell you what it is, and I get it almost every day, is when you put a DVD into the DVD player and you go through those endless warnings and then you suddenly realise an endless trailers. And when it comes to your film, you, you press a button, you suddenly realise you didn't press the subtitle button if it was a foreign film. So you have to take the DVD out, put it back in and start all over again. And I think, I think they really overdo it on those FBI warnings. Uh, I mean, a very short warning would be fine. And then they have endless graphics by all the film companies and film distributors involved in the thing that are all at least 10 seconds long and are at three times the volume of the, of the normal video. So those annoy me. <laughs> Which is surprising, though, because Dyson protect their intellectual property quite mm -hmm. intensely. Do you believe that all intellectual property should be defended absolutely in the courts? Very much so, but we don't ram it down anyone's throat like that and force them to sit in front of a There's no warning before you buy, you buy no, an airplane. There ought to be a warning to stop people copying it, other manufacturers copying it, but as far as our customers are concerned, they, we want them to use the product with enjoyment and not have to read anything. But no, I mean, it, the, the courts should uphold intellectual property, and intellectual property should be stronger. And if it were, there would be more competition because um, you know, Korean companies and Chinese companies, instead of copying us, would be forced to develop their own technology so the consumer would get a better choice. And it's, it's a highly immoral thing to go around copying somebody because somebody who's taken a risk, spent a lot of money, taken a risk, created a market for something, then finds these Koreans and Chinese coming along saying, oh, that was a good idea. They copy it, they have no development costs, no risk money, and of course they can be cheaper because they haven't had all the upfront development costs and the cost of developing a market. So I think it's, it's bordering on the criminal, it's immoral, and courts should be much tougher about punishing people who do that. Is there a piece of design, and it could be software or hardware or anything, that you wish you'd come up with? <laughs> well, the, the, it, the jet engine is the one I wish I'd come up with. 
because it was quite brilliant. You know, not reciprocating engines have two and a half thousand moving parts. And then Whittle, um, while he was at, um, actually it was a, uh, a technical college, part of the RAF before the war, and he had a child's exercise book. And he wrote down the whole principles of the jet engine in a remarkably simple way, uh, explaining their virtues, lack of vibration, ability to fly at very high altitudes, and of course speed, and no moving parts. And uh, so to turn a highly sophisticated and well-developed reciprocating engine into something which has one moving part was just a miracle, absolutely brilliant. James Dyson, thank you so much for thank talking about One Plus One. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you very much. Ta. Thank you.